Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to the Linux Toolkit. I am Sandro, I'm from The Alternative. This is Tux, my little friend and the emblem of Linux. And we are from thealternative.ch, Student Association of ETH and University of Zurich, doing digital sustainability. So today in the Toolkit course, you are going to learn all the basics that you will need for later advanced tasks. There will be absolutely no Click Ubuntu thing. You will not learn how to use any of the GUI that we have installed on your system for those who came to the install event. Instead, you will actually be learning the console. And now that was a choice that we did. Um, it is certainly very nice for those who want to go far in Linux. It's probably not that nice for those who just came here to learn like the things that you do for your office use. Now, if you have any questions about GUI, you can always come to us at our Stammtische or just uh, write us an email, of course. Now, today what you're going to learn is all the theory, all the, the very dry basics that you will need for the course tomorrow. And tomorrow there's going to be the practice, like the cool stuff. But you will need this today for tomorrow. So we're going to go very fast, time is limited, and there's a lot to say. Here under this QR code you can download our slides from our main website. Uh, that way, you, if, you, if, you, if I'm too fast for you, you can always keep reading on your own laptop. And of course you can try these commands on your laptop immediately. There is a recording of this lecture, and if it succeeds you will be able to see that on, uh, on our webpage within the next few days or weeks. Okay, so today all the basics. And this is really your basic skill set that you will get, and you really have to know these things if you want to go really far. So this is what is shared among pretty much all Linux systems, and it will allow you to control your router, to control your computer, to control your NAS, your server, whatever you want. If you have Raspberry Pi, everything you're going to learn today is going to be applicable to that. So it's, it's, I think, really the kind of wings that you will need to fly away. So. Why do we tell you about the console? So, in the past years, we've done, first of all, we've done only GUI stuff. Then we, people told us, well, not to learn the console. We started with that. And every semester, they told us, do more console, do more console. So this semester, we have even the 10 minutes of the last course that we had, we kicked that out, and there is 100% console course. And on the feedback sheets uh, that you give us, you are able that way to influence uh, whatever you go people from next semester so are going to see. And then, of course, there are headless machines. Headless means that they don't have a screen. So, like, for example, a, a server uh, usually doesn't have a screen attached to it. So the only way to communicate with it, or the most efficient way to communicate with it, is the console. Also, if you break your GUI, your console is the last thing that's going to stay alive, and that way you can still fix your computer. Uh, so that is... If you play around a lot, you will eventually probably end up just having a console in order to undo what you last did. And of course, for really advanced tasks, uh, you, you will need this. So this is what a console looks like. Um, does everybody know how to start a console on their system? Yeah, usually you just go to, uh, you just go to your start menu and you type terminal or console. On KDE, it's a console with a K. Um, so this is what it looks like on OpenSUSE. Uh, Ubuntu users have a slightly different image. So what you see on your left is your username. That's probably your first name. Then there is an at symbol, and then comes the computer name. Now under OpenSUSE it has some confusing name like this, PMCQ. That is the name of the computer. Then we have double dot, and here is the location. Now, you probably know from your file manager, like Windows Explorer or Finder under Mac, that you're always at some location. And you go up or you go down, navigating through your files. In the console, you have that too. And the current file path where you're at is written here. And this tilde symbol means your home folder. We'll see later what this corresponds to. And then there's this little symbol here, which you probably won't have under, under Ubuntu. You just have a dollar sign. Um, this means the computer is ready for your input. And now, console usually only does one thing at a time. Of course, there's process management nowadays. But unless you tell it to explicitly do so, usually commands will stay in the console and keep it busy until they are completed, until the program is done. And so when you see this, you know your computer is ready. And of course, you can style your console to whatever you want. For example, uh, mine looks like this. So whatever you prefer. 
Okay, so under Arch Linux, it looks a little bit different. Here you can see still uh, there's my username, my machine name, and here the tilde has moved a little bit to the left, and the dollar sign telling me that I am a non-privileged user. Under Ubuntu, you also have the dollar sign. It's basically on Windows, you have this administrator thing, run as administrator, you know, and there you can tell that here you don't have that administrator mode. It's called you are not root. I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, if you are root, if you are the administrator, you will see a, a hashtag instead. Okay, so this would be another shell, because in a console, not only um, what you saw before can run, but also some different so-called shells. The shell is basically what gets your commands when you type them in, and then produces output or starts different programs. So if you don't like this kind of message that you have, maybe you would prefer fish, uh, which is a, a different shell. Uh, you can have as many shells on your system as you want to. In the advanced course, we're going to present, so, uh, present some of them. I think in order to really understand what a shell does, you have to work with it. It's just it doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it can look like this. But here again, there is this tilde symbol telling me where I am, etc. Okay, so now yeah, we're going to learn your very first command. I think it's one of the most important ones. It's CD, which stands for Change Directory. So right now, we are in the home folder. And where that is, is not important for a moment. And we want to go, we know that in this home folder, there is a, a, fold, a, a directory. Um, by the way, I say sometimes folder. Under Linux, it's really called directory. But when I say folder, just think directory. Okay, so there's this directory in the home folder, which is called downloads. And I want to go into that directory. So what I do is I say CD, and then wherever I want to go, which is downloads. And you see now I am in the downloads folder. And you see a file path here is composed of a slash which goes forward. It's not a backslash like you have it on the, uh, on the Windows. On a Unix-based system, we have the forward slashes. OK, everything clear so far? Anybody not following? If you don't understand anything, lift your hand, OK? It's the only way you can get me to slow down. All right. So now that this is understood, there is a second command. This is PWD. And PWD is the question, where am I in the system? So if you type that, you will see the answer is home, Sandra, downloads. And so that told you something about it. Actually, tilde means slash home slash Sandra. This is my home folder. If you are a different user, then your home folder will probably be slash home slash whatever your username is going to be. So PWD tells you an absolute path without any shorthand notation. This is just syntactic sugar. And this and that is exactly the same thing, OK? And sometimes PWD is useful if you have a lot of links and you really want to know where you're at. So now I want to go one directory up. I'm currently in the downloads folder, as you probably remember. And I want to go up. Now, then every directory, there is a subdirectory called dot dot. And it's not really a subdirectory. Actually, it's a parent directory. So if you think in this as nodes and arrows, like like this diagram, the link back up is always dot dot. And you can say, I want to go dot dot. So this means bring me one up. And then you see that downloads, which we were dived into, has now gone. We are now back up in Sandra. OK, everything clear so far? OK, good. So of course, I can jump several directories at once. So this is already where we leave what you can do in the graphical user interface. Here, this is something. If you know, if you know that there is a folder called website in Documenta, you don't have to go CD Documenta and then CD website. You can just go CD Documenta slash website. So you enter here a so-called relative file path. So that means compared to where I am right now, I want to go to a sub-subfolder websites located in subfolder Documenta. This is different from absolute file path, which usually starts with the slash or with this tilde symbol, where you say, I want to go to exactly that folder, no matter where I am right now. Okay? So that's, that's a big difference. And similarly, of course, you can go up in one, you can go up two in one step. So we are here, we go to the dot dot folder of the, in this folder, which is one up, and in that folder, there is one up again. So this just jumps up tw uh, twice. Okay, nobody too bored yet? All right. And if you just type CD without anything, it brings you back to your home folder. No matter where you are, if you just type this, you're going to tilde. 
So um, this is probably looking a little bit scary. Um, where am I? What is there around? On the Windows, you probably know this uh, C double, double points, uh, C column thing, or D and A for the disk cat, floppy disk, if you remember. Under Linux, there is no such thing. Actually, everything that you have on your system starts with slash. Slash is called the root. It's just like in a tree. That's where everything comes out. And no matter what file you have, even your external hard drive, even your U USB key you plug into your computer, will be available somewhere under slash. So I'm probably not going to do this completely. Um, just the most important things. Root is the administrator of the computer. He's got a different home folder from anybody else. Where everyone else is under home username, Root has his home folder there. Um, then under opt, what you can do is install your own programs if they cannot be installed in a regular way. Um, dev is a unique special thing. Um, if you plug a USB key into your computer, it doesn't show up as a folder, but it will show up as a file. And it, this file will be located here. So this uh, is not something you have to understand yet. Just know that in dev, you will find any connected device to your computer. And later on, you will be able to access it from there, uh, making use of it. So for example, the main disk is under DAF SDA. And then the first partition on that disk is SDA1. However, if you plug in an SD card, it will probably show off as MMC0 for the first SD card. Second SD card will go to MMC1. And then P and the number of, uh, of the partition that you have. OK, so later on, usually if you if you have Ubuntu or OpenSUSE, when you plug in a USB key, the files of that key will, of course, not be under dev, since this is just a raw device. It's made accessible under media and MNT, depending what you choose. Media will usually show up in your, uh, in your um, file manager. However, MNT will be hidden, something that is rather advanced for you yet. Um, so, and sometimes it shows up under run media. So if you have a USB key uh, and you want to access those files, you sometimes have to go to slash media slash name of USB key or to run media name of USB key. That is specific to your system, and you just have to find it out once. Where is it? Try both. In one, you will find it, and then you just go for that forever. Okay, now software is usually installed into USR. This is the software that you install yourself using the package manager. Oh, by the way, anybody not know what the package manager is? OK, so a package manager is basically like an app store, but much more advanced. It's a program that will install and remove software on your system and as well update it. And the package manager installs its software into this USR uh, uh, folder. It's like the pro programs and settings uh, file of known. Documents and settings under Windows would probably correspond to the home folder. And then uh, program files would correspond to this folder. And there are two subfolders. One is bin, which, called, which contains the, actually, the actual programs, and the other one is libraries. If you don't know what libraries, don't worry. It's just all the software is in there if you install it, usually. And then under bin, there are Linux-specific things. ETC contains system-wide configuration. Boot, well, contains things you need to boot up, and run media we have covered. So you don't have to know that by heart. This is just a brief overview. You will be navigating through this a lot later on. So you can always come back to this slide uh, if you have any, any trouble. Okay, now, before we were navigating blindly, we just knew that there was a document folder or a downloads folder. Now, what we can do this time is we can tell the system, show me all the files and folders which are contained in the current directory. So the current directory being my home folder, what is in it? List. And then it tells me, well, there's all this. There's a folder called bin, a folder called desktop, documents, etc., and one file, which is called document1.odt. Now, the colors, I picked them like under default OpenSUSE installation. Of course, you can highly customize this. Under Ubuntu, it will just be white. Uh, on OpenSUSE, directories are blue. And again, this prompt tells you the system is ready for your next command, OK? Everything clear? Good, OK. So now what you're going to do is have a look again at the commands that we typed. And we will introduce a new terminology. These are just some vocabulary words you have to know. When you have a command, this is just your very first word that you type. And then you put in a space. And what comes after this space is either an argument or an option. Now, usually an argument is something that gives the system information about what you want to do with the command. So this, the system, uh, the command is 
What do I want to do? Then comes an argument saying, on what? So I want to change directory onto downloads. And then it's going to do it. And pretty much all the commands that you will type will have arguments or options uh, that specify the actual behavior. Because remember, if you don't give an argument to CD, it will just do what? Anybody knows? Go to home directory, yes. Absolutely. So this changes the behavior of the program called CD. And then, um, of course, we can give several arguments. For example, here you see I give document, documents and uh, a different argument, home Sandro, and it will show me both folders uh, in different lists. So LS will see, oh wait, there are several arguments. So first it titles, what is it? And then what does it contain? And here, the same thing with my other directory. Okay, is that clear so far? Good. And you see here we have a, a relative file path. That means in the current directory, subfolder documents. And this is an absolute file path. So this does, it completely ignores what is written here because it starts with a root, with a slash, meaning I want exactly this path, okay? Does anybody not understand what's the difference between absolute and relative? Okay, this is going to be important because sometimes you just have to use absolute file paths. Okay, now about, uh, with arguments comes also options, and whereas arguments tell you um, on what you want to do something, options will tell you how to do. Yes, question? The absolute path either starts with a slash or with a tilde. The slash meaning from root, which is this, which contains everything, or the tilde being this folder. Okay? Okay, so now about options. Options will specify how you want to have something. So it's not like the argument, an option is actually a, an argument as well, but it's a special argument. It does not give the program information about where it should do, or what it should do, but how to do it. So for example, with ls, with this list command, when you give it dash a, which is a, a single letter option standing for all, then it will show you more, including hidden files. So under Linux, uh, or even under Unix in general, files starting with a dot are hidden. You cannot see them. And if you could just go ls, then you will not see them, as you see here. It's completely hidden. And then if you go with this a, this a option, you will see them as well. But there are also two more subfolders that will show up. One is dot dot. You now know what that is. And the other one is dot. A dot is weird. Dot means the current directory. So if you go ls on documents, dot stands for documents. The, you will rarely use this, but you could, for example, see, say cd dot slash dot slash dot slash dot, and it will bring you absolutely nowhere. It's just in the current directory, the current directory, the current directory, okay? There is one, one thing I'm going to show you later where you probably want to use that. Um, and so there, there's two ways to get um, options to a command. This is a convention, again, not all commands have to respect that. But for example, ls does. There's a shorthand notation, which is just a single letter. The other one is a long notation, which is an entire word. And a short notation is just preceded with one dash. However, a word is preceded with two dashes. And you're going to see, uh, yes, right here, why this is important. So if you have a single letter option, having one dash in front of it, you can put several options behind each other without putting a space. And this is why it's important to do just one dash. One dash means there's exactly one letter which I'm expecting, and if there are several, bless you, each of them is an, uh, its own option. Whereas here, you don't want option A, option L, and option L. This is why you put two dashes in front of it, and it means it's an entire word, okay? This is a convention. It's very important that you don't think that everybody does it like that. But the basic Linux commands always respect this. Okay, so um, if we have ls with the option L, it will show us uh, the contents of the directory. So here this time, uh, it tells us first what is the total size of the directory. And then it will show us here uh, the actual size of this file, meow.txt. Also, we have some ownership information, which is not that important. Here is who created the file, that's me. And there is when it was last, uh, I think that is when it was last modified. 
some um, ls can be configured, and I think you can get it to to show you the the, la the creation date of the file. I think so. Okay, so um, there is an H flag because this is not really human readable. H means human, and uh, it stands for please make some more sensible numbers. So this is bytes, and then if you convert that to megabytes, this is 208. Um, no, there is no 208,000. Uh, millions because one, kilo, one kilobyte is 1024 bytes, not a thousand. Just a detail. So this means 208 megabyte big file meow.txt, which is a very large for a text file. And as you saw, we concatenate these. I can also go lsalh or lah or whatever I want. Okay, um, so how about spaces? Several ways to deal with spaces. Um, one is you put like Windows style, you put the uh, brackets, not brackets, um, quotes around it, and that way it can contain a space. Or what you can do under Linux is you can escape the space. Backslash space means this is not, these are not two different arguments, but it's one argument that contains a space, okay? Because if, we, if I didn't have that space, it would mean put me an ls on document and put me an ls on one.odt. But with the backslash, this means I want an ls on a single file document space one.odt, okay? If you have two spaces, you have to escape both of them. Or if you just want to go like this, of course, that works too. Okay, so um, next thing is how you can get help for yourself. And this actually means read the fucking manual. Um, sorry for cussing, this is actually a word that is widely used in the internet. Uh, if someone asks a very obvious question, someone else might just reply. RTFM. I mean, you could have looked it up yourself. So, TFM is basically M-A-N. It's the command for manual. And if you want to know more about LS, what was that again? How was it used again? You can go man LS. And then under SUSE, it asks you these really weird questions. Just hit enter, you know. It's not, you don't care what page you want. And then you get this. And this is actually a little text browser. And you can scroll through it using your arrow keys. Uh, there's also page up, page down if you want to scroll faster. Or you can use your scroll wheel if you're on a, on a normal terminal. And this looks a little bit confusing maybe right now. So this tells you, first of all, what are you looking at? Here's just some random title. There we go, what is the command named? and here, or whatever the, the authors named it. And then we see the synopsis. Synopsis means, how do I use that? And it tells you, well, if you have these brackets here, that means it's optional. You don't have to put anything that has brackets. So remember that if you don't have any brackets, ls will just show their direct, uh, the content of the current directory. But you could also use ls with a file name. And then what's going to happen is it's going to show the contents of the file if it's directory, or show the size of the file itself, or just the name of the file itself if it's a file. But you could also just put an option and omit the file. So if you do that, you have, for example, ls-a, which we did before, showing all the files in the current directory. Or we put both of them, ls-a, and then whatever we want to look at. Okay? So this is what these brackets tell you. There's a lot of information in this synopsis. And then, of course, there's the description, and it will tell you a lot of information about all the possible options that you can have. Some documentations, especially the ones of the programs I'm going to show today, are very complete, very long. Um, so everything that the program can do, and I tell you LS is big, LS can do a lot of things, is documented in there. Um, you don't really have to read it all. I probably know about 2% of what's written in there. That's perfectly fine for everyday use. So here again, you see the shorthand notation, the longhand notation, and then this dot and dot dot that showed up in blue before, you can omit that by going capital A. So yes, of course, the console is case sensitive. So if you type documenta small, it will not find it because there's no directory with a, with a non-capital documenta. So um, some more uh, important commands are probably Q, which gets you out of less, uh, which gets you out of, of the man page, and a slash. Now, if you press a slash on your computer, you can type something and hit, uh, hit enter, and it will search for a term. So I think I have a demo for that, right? So I type slash, and in the bottom left, there's a slash appearing. So now I can type list, and I hit enter, and as soon as I hit enter, there's a search function. 
that gives me old list. And then I can go, just go slash enter, slash enter, slash enter in order to browse through all the, the search results. Okay, any questions about man or anything else? Okay, this is important. This is your way to get help without an internet connection, without anything else but your console. And it's, lots of commands are really well documented, so it does make sense to, to know that. Okay, so now that you know the very basics, um, we saw many of you typing really, really long commands by hand in the install event, or retyping commands that I just did. Here are a few tricks how to get lazily efficient. Computer scientists are really lazy, and Linux has been written by programmers, so they have a lot of tricks you can do without having to type everything. So first of all, uh, consider this situation. We have here uh, this home folder, and in a home folder, uh, a subdirectory videos. And this is the only directory that we have in the home folder for this example, okay? I do not have to type CD videos. There's no need for that. I just go CDV and I hit tab, you know, tabulator. Everybody okay with that? And hop, it's going to be auto completed. Now, in order to indicate that videos is a directory, it adds me this slash. I don't have to care about the slash. You can remove it or you can keep it, whatever you want. So, Another thing is if there are several folders which start with the same name. F for example, we have three folders with D, and all of them would be possible to CD into. The system doesn't know what to complete it. So when you go CDD and you press tap, the system will refuse to do anything. But now, hint, hint, press tap again. And then it will show you all possibilities that you have for auto-completion. Here being desktop documents and downloads. So now you type the O, and you go tap, tap again, and Again, it doesn't know what to do because there are still two possibilities, starting with DO. And so if you go CD DOW and you press tap, then this time there's only one option left and hop, it completes with downloads. Now, of course, um, you don't have to press tap up here. You can just go CD DOW, tap, and it will auto complete it. But if tap doesn't work, tap, tap twice. And if it still doesn't work, it means there's absolutely nothing matching your search, okay? And your tap key is probably soon going to be, except for the enter key, the most used button on your entire keyboard. Okay, so um, you have a history. All commands are recorded in your history, and you can browse it. And you just type arrow up, and it will show you the last command that you have. Also, if you go up again, it you just browse through that history. It's like a list of the last commands that you've had. And if your arrow key is up and down, you can navigate through it. Up, oh, there it is. And then um, for your navigation keys, um, once you have a line, like if you, if you are in a line like this and you see, oh, no, I forgot to, to add something in front, of, uh, in front of the line, you don't have to go back with your arrow keys all the time because your keys like home and end on your keyboard, they still work in the console. And, of course, you can use, um, uh, you can use control A uh, instead of home. For those who have using, been using that uh, on typical Unix systems, this also works in Linux. And it's like in Word, you probably used to pressing control and then back and forward jumps one word. On your console, that will work too, mostly. Um, in some text editors, it's disabled because it has some different keyboard shortcuts. But for typing regular commands, for your different words, can use control arrows. Now, there's one more thing that is really useful. It's control R. Um, oh, by the way, this little hat symbol means control. So control R means retype. And this is searching in your history, but this time it's not going through it like a list. But what it's going to do is it's going to let you ask for something. So when you press that, it says reverse I search, and then there's, there are these two little apostrophes. And now you're going to be typing in that. And write, it will autocomplete everything uh, that... It will autocomplete with the most recent match that will match your search query. Uh, that is a really nice feature if you have typed a command like two days ago and you've typed 200 commands since, and it's like, oh no, it was a command long like that. How did that go again? You just take a, a substring of that command and you type it in, control R, type it in, and it will pop up immediately if you search well. This comes in really handy. Um, in order to, to get out of this, press tap. Uh, then you, uh, this will disappear and this will become the new line. And if you type something that makes no sense, it will say failed reverse iSearch. That means you have to, you have to stop. Okay? 
Okay, uh, for God's pseudo, um, if you do something, um, let's come back to that slide. It's sorry, my error, I put it in too early. Okay, so um, you can use wildcards. Um, some of you probably are used to search in databases. Um, so what you can do is, if you, uh, well, let's, let's do case study. So first of all, we look at this folder called stuff, and it contains all these documents. You saw, see lots of them start with docu something. Some of them have uh, analysis in it somewhere, and some of them end with txt. So they have quite a few shared things that they have. Now, we want to delete all the files that start with docu. So that will be this one, and that one, and that one. Now, what you could do um, for, for deleting, there's a command called rm, um, which I'm going to introduce a, a little bit later, I think. rm uh, means remove. And it has an option V, which stands for verbos, which means tell me what you did. So it deletes, com it deletes files, and it tells you whatever it has deleted. So nothing, nothing really complicated here. So instead of going RM docu analysis, docu bio, and docu physics, which would be three things to type, right? We're lazy, we don't want to. We just go RM docu star. And that asterisk can be replaced by anything. So this means anything that starts with docu. And you see that, indeed, exact these three matches have been removed. Okay. Um, so now when we go ls, we see that these are gone. There's just four things left. Now we want to read anything that contains analysis. Because, you know, second semester is over. We're quite happy. Paste the basis prüfung, And we're going to get rid of that. So this time, we cannot just go analysis star, because there is my analysis, which does not fit analysis star. But you can just put another star. So this means anything that contains analysis with no matter what is in front and behind it. OK? And then, effectively, these three files will be deleted. Is, is the asterisk clear for anybody? Who is not clear with that? Oh, wow, OK, because last time, many people struggled with that. Maybe you're just lying to me, right? OK. okay. And you see there's just one file left. So quite happy with that. OK, now there's a command called yes. And yes, all it does is repeating whatever you give it as an argument over and over and over, nonstop repeating. And you cannot get out of it. It never stops. So there is a universal thing that you can do in a console, which is Control c Control c does not mean copy. Control c means cancel. And that interrupts whatever is running, except for some really, really stupid program showing a train going through your PC when you mistype a command. That one cannot be stopped, but it's probably not going to be on your, on your PC. OK, so it just prints hello world, hello world, hello world all the time. I go control C, and it stops immediately. Also, if I type something, and I want to cancel that, like I haven't pressed return yet, I just want to get out of what I'm currently doing, I can go control C. Don't have to, re to erase all this line with backspace. I can just go control C and tuck it gets me out of there immediately. So control C is really your escape button, okay? Um, now how do we copy and paste in a console? Because you can select text with your mouse. Actually two ways to do it. The first one is the old style one, which is nowadays not that famous anymore. If you select a text with your mouse, it has already been copied. You can paste it by middle clicking, like your scroll wheel. If you click that, um, it will paste whatever has been selected last. But Control C, Control V works also, but you have to press Shift. So it's going to be Control Shift C, copy, and Control Shift V for paste, okay? And Control C is cancel. Do not confuse those two. You're going to mess up some things if you do. You probably will. I've done it 100 times. <laughs> Just remember, Control shift c for copying, Control c uh, for canceling. OK. So I think it's time for your very first text editor. That is Nano. Nano is called that because it's so small. There are many different text editors in a console, like, for example, VI, some of you might know, or Vim, or even Emacs. Uh, these are very much more powerful than Nano is. Nano is small and simple and probably one of the most user-friendly ones there are. And so if you, want, if you have a file called letter in your current folder, you can go Nano letter. So you just give Nano as an argument whatever you want to edit. If the file does not, create, uh, does not exist yet, Nano will create it upon saving. And you don't have to, to have the .txt extension. Um, you just Type letter. You can have TXT if you want to, but under Linux it doesn't really matter 
uh, what extension you're going to put onto it. Okay, so now we have done this, we've pressed return, and Nano has opened. Now, this is something I type by hand, this is a screenshot, that's why it's had different colors, but symbolics would be the same thing. Okay, so what does Nano tell you? First of all, it tells you who it is and what version it has, and then what file you are currently editing. And then in the bottom you see new file has popped up. That means that this letter file has not existed yet. It's something that if you expect a file to be existing and you get this, then you know you have misspelled something. And then on the bottom here, it tells you all the, the help that you need. So, for example, if you want more help about Nano, you go Control G. If you want to exit Nano, you go Control X. And of course, Nano will ask you for confirmation if you have modified but not saved. And then there's a search feature, which is nice, Control W, or uh, replace. Now, cut and uncut, actually, you can go, you can cut lines. Like if you have 10 lines that you want to move somewhere, you go Control K, 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 10 times, and it will eat them up all the time. And then you go where you want to paste it, Control U, and it just puts everything that it has eaten up before in there. Now, you know that Control Shift C and Control Shift V works, however, Control Shift X does not work. So you will probably have to rely on that feature. Or just get a more powerful text editor. And then um, Control C here does not work. As you see, that stands for current position. This is an exception. Yes? No, you can, in, with Nano you can give uh, as an argument either a relative file path, which could be any file path, or an absolute file path. So here it's the most simple file path you can have, it's just the name. But I could type here Nano Home Sandro Letter, no matter where I am. Or I could go Nano Document Slash Letter. This is universal, this is not only Nano, you can always type, if it says a file, you can always type directory slash file dot dot slash anything slash file. I mean, you can be in a, in a folder, go one up and then go two down again uh, without changing directory. This is completely up to you. Okay, so I typed something and as you see, uh, this should be the, so there's absolutely no grammar check and also there's no spell check. Nano is simple, again, that's why it's called Nano. In the top right now it says modified, you have not saved your buffer. So go control O to save and control X to exit your, uh, your Nano. And if you don't like Nano, there are so many more. Try VI. Uh, I've never figured it out. It's really complicated to me because it has so many features. Um, but you know, all my friends who are a little smarter than I am, they just love it. So I have to recommend it. It seems to be really great. OK. Um, now we have edited files. Um, let's look at files we have edited. So there is less. Again, you can use any kind of uh, file path that you want. And if you go less letter, it will show up like this. So less will not enable you to edit a file. It's just read only. And this is really good if you want to be sure that you don't write onto something by, by accident. So it tells you how many lines it has, how many lines it is displaying right now, and that this is already the end. There's no way to go further. Now, actually, the keyboard shortcuts are exactly the same as for a man. It's slash to search, Q to quit, and H for help, etc., etc., etc. Why is that the case? Uh, did someone lift up the hand? I was blinded by the projector. I oh, know. Okay. Um, so why are the keystrokes the same as in man? It's because man uses less. When you type man something, you will get a file which exists on your computer opened by less. That is, it's the same program. So man is just gonna use less. That's that's a nice thing to know. Okay. Now let's talk about kitties. Cat is another way to get to look at a file. However, uh, instead of, you know, less opens up in a screen and then you, when you close it, it's gone. Cat, what it's just going to do, it's going to print all everything that is in the letter to the console as output. And that is good if you want to redirect that output, which is a more advanced topic. Um, but if your file is two gigabytes large and you go cat file, it will print two gigabytes of text onto your screen and that just goes on forever. What do you got to do in that situation? Control C, yeah, great. Okay, uh, these are cats. So now we're going to copy files. Um, CP is the copy command. It takes a source and a destination. Again, you can have path, whatever you want. So what you can do here is we have this situation. We have a letter, and we want to have a letter and another level, both being equal. We go CP, letter, another letter. It's going to take this, copy it, put it there. That's it. 
If you want to copy something into a subfolder, you go CP letter subfolder slash letter. Just copy it in. If you want to copy it onto your USB drive, you go CP letter slash media slash your USB drive slash whatever folder you want it at. This is this is really where this absolute and relative paths get in really really handy. Okay, and I I'm not sure, but I think you can even use the asterisk. You can go CP and then uh, anal store analysis store and then a subfolder target. Um, this time, however. Uh, in the target folder, I would recommend you to add a slash at the end. That means into that folder. Um, did I document that? Yes. Um, we'll, you will see it with, with MV. MV is the same thing as CP, but it will delete what is in the origin. So this you're going to be using for moving files and for renaming files. Now, if you think about what is renaming, there is no rename command under Linux. Renaming is just moving a file to the same folder, right, under a different name. And so there is no, no renaming operation. You're just going to move it. So if I want to rename this letter to renamed letter, uh, now it was another letter renamed renamed letter, I could do it this way. And since both paths are in the same folder, the file is not moved in your folder hierarchy. Okay? Everything clear so far? Okay, so now what you can do is... Instead of giving a target name, I give a target folder, and I add this slash, like I said before. And then here, what it's going to do, it's going to keep the original name that it has, and it's going to put it into that folder. So this is perfectly equivalent to saying MV letter documents slash letter. It's just a shorthand notation. If you add this slash, you don't need to enter the same uh, file name again. And again, use tab completion. It speeds up your workflow. And you see that afterwards, everything is as we expected it. Okay? Any questions about these really weird path things? Not too confused yet? Okay, so then there comes the rm command. Uh, I introduced it a little earlier. It seemed very simple, but it's too simple. Actually, there is no trash can. Even though you have, you have a trash can on your graphical file manager, probably. But in the console, you have none. If you want to put a file into a trash can, move it somewhere else. But don't just RM it. RM means delete, and it's gone. It's gone forever. Okay, so if you go RM, renamed letter, and documents slash letter, you see I don't have to change here anything, just give the relative path. Both are gone afterwards. And it's irre irreversible. And uh, this, is, this is very typical in the console. When you do something, it happens. If you have 10 files, one starting with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and you type a 5 instead of a 6, 5 is gone. I'm sorry. So this is one of your favorite ways to destroy your data. So always keep a backup, okay? All right, now um, let's do something safer. Let's create folders and delete them. Very, very trivial. mkdir, make dir, creates directory. And you see, woohoo, it has been created. I can say rmdir, remove the directory. And it's gone. Okay. Why do I say this is a saver? Actually, RMD will only delete empty directories. So if I, have, if I want to delete my downloads folder, it will tell you fail to remove downloads directory is not empty. And what happens if you by accident delete a directory which is empty? Well, you just recreate it, you know? But how do we delete now uh, directories which are non-empty? There again, we go to the dangerous command, RM. RM has an option which you can give to it, which is R, which stands for recursive. Recursive means go into all subfolders that you can find. So what this is going to do, it's going to take your folder that you're specifying, goes om nom 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 nom, all the way, anything that I can get within that folder, and then finally it will delete the downloads folder. So if I do that, and I have 155 gigabyte of my favorite videos, my videos are gone. Forever, irreversible, it's it. that's it. If you do RMR in your home folder, any data that you have in your home folder is gone. Okay? This is the ultimate killer command, which you can do without being a privileged user. All right, so now um, what we're going to do is uh, running a program in the current folder. You remember that dot notation that I showed you? Dot, dot meaning one level up, dot meaning current folder. This is where you're going to use it. And this is really the only use I know for the dot notation. So um, by default, when you type a command, it's not just 
You know, your shell is not magic. It doesn't know, oh, wait, there is... Oh, oh by the way, um, one, one more information. For those who do not have Nano installed on OpenSUSE systems, that's normal. Um, we will install it during the course. So if you tried it out and it said, command not found, that's okay, we're going to install it now. Okay, so on, uh, on your shell doesn't know that Nano exists, you know. Your, your, your console doesn't just magically open up Nano. Your console has a setting, a setting of any folders, directories, where it's going to be looking for a command called Nano. And the command under, uh, under Linux is just an executable file. So it's a regular file, and it has some special property, which is the executable property. And so what it's going to do is it's going to look exactly in these folders, unless you've configured it differently. One is, the first one is my home folder. And then in that folder, there is another folder called bin. It's going to look if there is anything executable. And of course, only, only my personal uh, account does that. If I have another user called Peter on my laptop, uh, he will have his own, home f his own home folder and not Sandro. And if it finds a, f a file called nano, which is executable in this bin folder, it will run that one. That way you can override behavior, okay? So if you put a virus called nano into that folder, then it will just run your, your, your virus instead of nano. So it would be theoretically very easy to make people run by accident viruses. But we're going to show you later on how the package manager works. Uh, the package manager makes it, unless you want to have a virus, it makes it impossible to, to get a virus. That's why there are no viruses in practice, actually. So next thing is this one, user local bin, then user bin, then bin, then user bin x11, and user games. These are exactly the folders we're just going to look at. If it has gone through all these and there has been no file called nano being executable in any of those, it will tell you command not found, okay? All right, and so now, um, remember probably this means current tier, current directory. What we can do now is I have here this, under, under SUSE they show up uh, green, this executable file called hello world. This is not a text file, this is a program, uh, which, I, which I programmed really quick. So when I go... Uh, if I want to go uh, to the downloads folder and move this file into the downloads folder, I can, you know, usually, okay. Usually what you would have done is you are in the current folder and you say mv hello world download slash. Probably as you remember from before. That way you put it down. You are up and you put it down. But now we're going to do a different approach just to demonstrate the dot. We go first down into the, nano, uh, into the downloads folder. And then we're going to grab the Hello World program and drag it down to us. So the syntax is just like we had seen in, uh, in the MV. MV what? To which folder with a slash? And this time we're doing MV, Hello World in the parent folder. Okay? This is a relative path, specifying this file. And then into where? Into dot, which is the current folder. Add the slash behind it. And it's going to pull the hello world down, okay? It's exactly the same thing as we did before, but this time just from a, a different viewpoint. Everything clear? Okay. So, the problem is, if we want to run this hello world, if we just type hello world, what's going to happen is it's going to search in all these paths, and there will be no hello world, and it will tell us command not found. What we want to do instead is we want to be sure that we... In, we execute this not in the standard paths, but in the current directory. And in order to specify that, we say, in the current directory, execute hello world. Because there is no command for running a program. It's just dot, slash, and then this. And then, of course, if hello world takes arguments and options, it's exactly the same thing as you have learned before. What you can also do is, if you go one up, you can also go download slash hello world without any command in front of it. Because remember, the first thing that you type is the command. So the command becomes, instead of something that is already installed in your system, actually a file. It doesn't make a big difference. It's just that this time you specify a path instead of letting your system check its own paths. And there you don't need a, a dot, because here, immediately, you, it, it just knows there's a slash in here. Since there is a slash, it cannot be a regular program name, since regular program names uh, don't have slashes in them, okay? So this dot is something that you need to, to run a program in the current folder if it's not in any of the standard folders. 
Okay, so um, this is the second scariest slide I have, and don't worry, um, it's just as unhorrible as the scariest I have. We're going to look at every, all the files that are in my current home folder. And you see there are, there's the usual stuff that I have showed you before, but there are many, many hidden files starting with dots. That's why they are called dot files. Uh, dot files usually mean your configuration, because your configuration, which is user-specific, sits in your home folder under a hidden dot file. Okay? That's why they're called dot files. So one of the interesting files is probably bash history. It contains that list of commands that you have entered. Because your this, this thing that displays that, that's called bash, which is a program which reads your input and reacts to it. And that bash keeps in your home folder under dot bash history, your history. You can, you can less it or cat it if you want to. Uh, it's quite interesting what it says. Then you have a configuration of your bash, which is bash RC. Um, C stands for configuration, or I have no clue. Anybody knows? OK. Well, it's not important anyway. Then you have a folder which is called .config, and that is very scary because it contains much, much more subfolders. It's just configuration, and usually you don't have to deal with that. Your, your file manager, your desktop environment, your browser, all of them store their configuration, your, history, your browsing history, your themes, whatever you want, as a dot file somewhere. And since there are so many dot files in your home folder, someone decided, well, let's put it in that config, and then there's all the crap. You usually don't need that, but if you ever have to, like for example, if you have a Thunderbird or, or Firefox, uh, you want to copy your all, all your user files, your user data, onto a different machine, you will find it either in there or in a .mozilla, I believe, or .firefox, something like that. And then you also see there are some logs. Um, for example, XFCE, which is a desktop environment probably some of you have. XFCE puts, uh, it like it talks, it says, hey, I just did that, I did that, I did that, and it puts it in there. And so when something goes wrong, like why do I have no mouse, or why is my mouse like a cross, or what's going on? You can go check this. I will say, oh, didn't find a mouse pointer. You say, oh, right, I moved that in that folder, and of course it doesn't find it. So logs lock sometimes help you uh, to know what's going on. Um, for example, if you go to that .config folder, here there are not many programs installed, so it's not that scary yet, but on my computer, for example, it's just horribly crowded. You see Tunar, which is the file manager under XFCE, or XFCE4 itself, uh, put their configuration files in there. And if something really goes wrong, sometimes it helps to delete this folder. Either uh, you move it somewhere else, like you rename it, then it won't find it, so it falls back to the whole behavior, creates a new folder, and it might work again. Or you go RMR, and then it's gone. So probably try to move it first. Huh? This sometimes good debugging. Okay, so this is carrier slide. This is what you have when you go ls slash etc. Now this is the system-wide configuration. Um, I felt like putting it all here, I didn't feel like coloring the directories blue, so there are some directories, but I didn't color them. Okay, so the only thing that may be of interest to you, I have to say 80% of this, I have no clue what's going on. So, um, cron jobs, like, you know Windows tasks? Some system administrators might know. Um, this is just periodical stuff that you can execute again and again. Um, oh, by the way, you will find these slides under thealternative.ch. You just click on Know How. All the slides are already online. OK, CUPS is your printing daemon. Like your configuration of your printers will probably sit there. Then you have your, your installed fonts. FSTab is everything that the system will look at in the beginning. Like you can, sell, you can tell the system to look for a USB key and to plug that USB key into a certain directory. FSTab is doing that. That's a more advanced topic. Grub is your bootloader, like the thing that comes up that asks you, do you want to boot Windows or Linux? Um, host name, this contains your machine name. Like this thing is written under slash etc slash host name. And if you change it and you reboot, your machine will have a different name. It's a configuration. Your machine name is a configuration file, and it sits under system-wide configuration, etc. Network Manager is um, what's enabling you to go online, most of you at least. Uh, NTP, Network Time Protocol, um, when you talk your computer onto the internet, it automatically synchronizes its clock with uh, the internet clock. 
That's NTP. Pulse is your, your audio system. If you have it installed, some don't. Samba, uh, <laughs> Samba enables you to go to Windows computers. Uh, network sharing. And system D is uh, for the init service. So it all, it all sits in there and many more as you saw there. So, okay. You don't, you don't need to remember that. But just know system by configuration is an ETC. User configuration is in home, your username, and then dot fast. Okay, so um, I have two kinds of users on my system. One is me. I have no right to do anything except for my home folder. Uh, in there I can do everything because it belongs to me. And that is why I have user bin. User bin contains the software that I put myself in it without being administrator, without having any rights. I can put my software in it, install it in a way, and then I'd be fine. But I cannot do anything to other users. I cannot install remove software. I cannot install updates. I cannot change the time. I can, some of them, I cannot even turn off the computer. Okay? You can configure it whatever you want. As a non-privileged user, you only have the right to access your own stuff. So there's root. Root is sometimes called super cow or god. Now, the reason for that is root can do anything that is physically possible. And uh, root is only once on a system. Every system in Linux has one root user and just one. Exactly one. Not less, no more. Sometimes, for example, under Ubuntu, there is no root password known to the user. It's auto-generated upon installation and will put onto the root user and not display it anymore. So no one knows what, if you have Ubuntu, you have no chance of figuring out what your root password is. You can never log in as root. But you're going to see um, there are tricks to get to become root anyway. Not, not tricks, actually programs which have been developed especially for that. So root can do anything. Um, also, it can start and stop any process, also of other users. It can delete any file on the computer. Uh, yeah, super cool. Okay, so how do you become a different user? The sudo command. Uh, um, sudo is starts... Is, whatever you start with sudo will become uh, something that root is going to do. So if you go just go sudo nano something, then a root will be editing that file, not yourself. This is why you don't have to know the user password for root. It's because sudo, at least on, on Ubuntu, uh, it will become root with your own password. There's another command which is just su, which works on OpenSU, which does not work in, on Ubuntu, which asks you for the root password. You don't need to know that, just know that if you want to become root, to do something important system-wide, you go sudo and then whatever you want to do. Now you can become root permanently. That is called sudo su. And sudo su will make you go into super cow mode. So for example, here you can see I get sudo su and then I get this, uh, this hashtag which I was talking about. Now I am not Sandro anymore. Now I'm root. How can you tell? Before it said tilde, meaning my home folder. And when I say sudo su, I'm still in the same folder, but this time it's not tilde anymore. The reason is, root has its home folder in slash root, not in slash home something. Uh, that is why I cannot say tilde, because tilde is only my, my own, but I am now root. So this is Sandro's folder, which is not me anymore. Okay, okay now let's, let's have a little example. Um, if I want to copy uh, the fs tab into another fs tab, I, I want to create a new file under slash etc, which as a non-privileged user Sandro, which is me, I don't have the right to do. And it will tell me, cannot create regular file, permission denied. So I can go sudo, and there it will do it. It asks me for password first. One confusing thing that you have, you don't see the password while you're typing. You just type blind. You can also backspace one letter, two letters, whatever you want. It just doesn't display it. Uh, under macOS, it's the same thing with a key being displayed. Uh, and it's like, you know, there's this joke, buy me, go buy me coffee. It's like, no, certainly not going to buy you coffee. Sudo go buy me coffee. And the person just goes and gives you a coffee. <laughs> if if uh, the world was as easy as Linux, probably that would be nice. So um, I can try to remove F another FS tab, which I created up there. And it will tell me it's right protected. Do you really want to remove it? I say yes. And then tries and Permission denied. No way to do it. Because I forgot sudo. So I can go either sudo rm or 
Here is the other way. I go sudo su. Now I am root, and I don't need to go sudo anymore, because now I'm root. Root has the right to do anything. It's just go rm etc under fs tab, and it's going to be deleted. And then if I want to go, I, I opened a new shell on top of my session. Like when I when I open up a terminal, I'm connected to my computer. I have a session, and on top of that, oop, I open up a new session being root. And if I want to close that session, I go exit or control D. And I fall back to where I, wa where I was before. Okay. Now there was a slide about uh, being fast that I showed you before. Uh, let me see. I think it was. Uh, let, where is it? No. Here. There we go. So I have this file meow.txt, and it's read protected for normal users. So either I can, you know, I just I already typed cat meow.txt and it tells me permission denied. So what I can do now is I can go arrow up, it shows me the last command, I go home, I type sudo, space, enter, and it's going to do it. So this being an error that is very commonly done, people have thought about a way that make it nicer. If you go sudo and bang bang, then what's going to happen is it going to run the last command that you have had again but as sudo. And you see that people who programmed that feature were really angry. <laughs> okay, so that is, I, I will have to move that slide down. Sorry for wrong ordering. Okay, so that's it about two users. Now we're going to talk about my very favorite topic, the package manager. Package manager is, as I said, that thing on your computer that manages your software. Now, as I told you, you could easily execute a virus by chance if you had one in your system. So. The most important thing on Linux is not to get a virus on your system. How do you do that? It's by never getting software onto your system that you didn't create yourself. So you let someone else do it who is more competent than you are, the package manager. Package manager is your friend, probably going to be your best friend very soon. Um, imagine you have a program which is, I don't know, Firefox. You want to install Firefox. Firefox depends on so many other programs. Like Maybe there is like an entire framework that needs to be loaded into your computer in order that Firefox even works. It, it's called dependencies. It depends on other software. It's built on top of that software, which you don't have on your system. Package manager, you tell the package manager, hey, install Firefox. It's going to go through its lists. It has big, big books, which it keeps track of. And it sees, oh, wait, Firefox needs this, that, 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 and that. I'm just going to install that for you, too. And you, all you have to do is hit return. So package manager has so-called repositories, or repos in short. This is actually a list, of uh, a list of servers where it can go to and check for new software. And this is the only really security crucial thing in a package manager, this is your, uh, your repositories. If you have uh, a repository on your, on your, in your package manager which gets hacked or which, which gives bad software, then your system will be infected. Package manager doesn't know Cannot, cannot verify the quality of the repositories. So you have to, do, to be sure to do that. Now, on your system, having a default OpenSUSE or default open, uh, Ubuntu installation, you don't have to care about that. You just have the official repos, and you know they're fine. You know, these, are, these are people, they know what they're, talking, they're, what they're doing. You can trust them. And so don't, uh, don't worry about any uh, security issues here. Linux Mint, unfortunately, just recently got hacked. That's why we don't recommend that uh, distribution anymore. They didn't react properly. But SUS and Ubuntu are big enough to, to be very fast reacting if they get hacked. What they do, if a repo gets hacked, they just shoot it down immediately. Uh, so you won't get any infected software. Uh, so, okay. These are the repos. It's just a list of URLs, a list of links, of servers, which your package manager will contact, which you trust. You trust your repos. And so the package manager will do too, because he's your friend, right? He only does what you tell him to do. And then every time it gets this list downloaded, it checks with its local packages that it has. Software comes in so-called packages. That's why it's called the package manager. And it compares and sees, wait, I have Firefox, I don't know, just making up a number, 34 installed on my system. But like this repo has Firefox 35. Therefore, wow, genius, my Firefox is outdated. And so it's going to tell you, wait, there's an update that you can install. You say, do that. It's going to do it. And that's it. And this works for any installed software in your system. The package manager handles tens of thousands of packages for you. So you don't need to, 
to care about Java updates, Flash, and so on and so on. Package Manager does that. It will install software. It's like you tell it, hey, install me Chromium, which is a, an open source version of Chrome. So it's going to go check its repositories. And just like with the path variable, it goes through until it finds what you're looking for. And it goes, grabs it, downloads it, installs it. That's it. You can also remove using the package manager. Uh, all, all everything that is software based can be using, doing, uh, using the package manager. Okay, um, so there are different terminologies, and this is where uh, I have to say whoever did that on Ubuntu uh, or Debian, Ubuntu does it that way because Debian did it that way. Uh, I don't know what he drunk. Actually, under Debian, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, etc., refreshing your information about what's up there is called an update, but it doesn't update any software. In order to update your software under Ubuntu, you have to go upgrade, okay? In OpenSUSE, it's different. The refreshing is called refresh, and the actual updating is called update. So the Ubuntu update is actually an OpenSUSE refresh, and the Ubuntu upgrade is the OpenSUSE update, okay? Just remember what your command is. For OpenSUSE, it's refresh, update, and uh, yeah, install, remove, of course. And under Ubuntu, it's update, upgrade. Also, there is a dist upgrade. Um, this is when you want to go to a higher version. For example, for Ubuntu users, that would be 15.4 to 15.10. That would be dist upgrade, distribution upgrade. For OpenSUSE, uh, it's just when you go to leave, for example. Yes, a question. Uh, how can I distinguish a bad from a good um, The good one, there's plenty of people. Uh, how, the question was, how can I distinguish a bad from a good repository? Good one, lots of people trust it. A bad one is something you have never heard of. A good one is, you, usually you don't need to add repositories. Um, there, OpenSUSE, for example, has community repositories. Usually you can trust those. Or um, f sometimes you go to the official developer. For example, there's a guy, uh, he's doing a program called Handbrake. He's called Stebbins. So you go to his website, and there is a repository link, which you just copy-paste, and, you know, Handbrake is a program everybody uses. I trust that guy, so I will trust his repo. But uh, in theory, uh, someone could put a malicious repo up, and then if you subscribe to that repo, you'll get bad software as well. But I've never seen or heard about any repo like that. Uh, I think they're out there because it's possible to do it. But when people tell you in communities, do this, do that, usually it's perfectly safe to do it. And else, if you really don't know, just come to us. Come to the Stammtisch, write us an email. But I've never had a situation of having to not to know whether I can trust or not. It's not like, uh, not like with the setups where you have, at every time you update a package, to know if you have to trust it. Because repos are really something you only need when there is a rather weird software which is not officially supported that you have to put in your system. Or weird or rare. Okay? So usually it's not a problem. But if you run into that situation, just contact us. Okay. So how does it look in practice? Um, in order to do zipper, you need to be root. So you have to do sudo always. If you don't, if you don't do it, sudo bang bang, OK? Uh, ref is a shorthand notation for refresh. What it's going to do is it's going to ask you for your password, unless you just entered it. And then it's going to update all the repositories it has, and says all repositories have been refreshed, meaning the package manager now knows if there are updates around. Now, this is an operation which OpenSUSE, for example, does automatically uh, if the packages are really outdated. Um, but if you want to force it right now, you can type ref or refresh. Under Ubuntu, that is called sudo apt-get update. OK, now, um, to update something, you can go sudo zipper update or up. That means install all the packages that are outdated. And here it's nothing to do. But if you have not installed updates for quite a while, then it will probably just work and go, go, go. Under Ubuntu, this is sudo apt-get upgrade. OK, now I can search. Uh, the package manager allows me to search, or SE, for a package. I can say, I want to I look for Chromium. And it tells me the following packages are around containing Chromium. And what I just wanted is a package called Chromium. So I see this is a normal package. This is probably what I want to install. Here's a summary. Of course, I made the console really small so I can enlarge the font. But um, on your console, probably this gets a little bigger. And so if I want to install that, I just go sudo zipper in or install Chromium. 
and it will go and have a look for exactly that package. And here we have some dependencies. Chromium also needs Chromium FFmpg sumo and libjpg62. And so it's going to install these as well. And do you really want to do that? So I have choice yes, no, or give me help. And you see that here in parentheses I have this uh, Y. So that means if I just hit enter, if I don't put anything, just hit enter, default action will be yes. Uh, that is convenient because you don't have to go, you know, programmers are lazy. <laughs> Okay, um, and then it's going to show all this, retrieving, installing, and that's it. And sometimes it talks to you a little bit, tells you, well, if you know what this means, you're going to be happy knowing that now. So you probably don't, so just ignore it. And it, you see here, this time you have really have to wait until you see that again. Console has been busy before, and now it's ready for your input again. Okay, again, uh, for removing something, there is remove or rm, zipper rm chromium. No, zipper rm chromium, okay? Not rm chromium, it's going to delete a file which is called chromium. You don't want that. Zipper rm for chromium. And it tells you, you need sudo privileges, so you go sudo bang bang, or sudo zipper rm chromium, okay? And you see that this package here, uh, even though you didn't tell it to uninstall it, this package does not need it by any other program and you did never install it by hand. So uh, if it, something is a dependency and you never, you never told Zipper to install it, it will consider that program as being unwanted unless necessary. So whenever you remove the program that uses that subprogram as a dependency, and this is the last program accessing it, dependency will be removed as well. Now if there if Zipper asks us to, install, to uninstall this also, it means that we are absolutely sure that no program that Zipper has currently installed uses that as well. So this is perfectly safe. They are extremely well, well done package managers. And again here, just hit enter. Okay, everything clear? Any questions about the package manager? Okay, who has successfully installed Nano within the last two minutes? Nobody. That's weird. I thought everybody would have started doing that. Okay, if you want to install Nano, just remember sudo zipper in Nano and you have the program on board. It goes very fast. Okay, um, so now let's deal with storage devices. And this is probably the hardest part of, of today's course. This is about mounting things. Mac users may know that already, um, but probably graphically. So, okay. If I have a USB key which I plug into the computer, it will show up as def sdb1. That means second device, which is USB key, first one being my internal SSD, and then one standing for first partition on that key. But I don't want that. This is just a file. I want actually to see the data which is on that USB key. Not, not the device, but the data that is behind it. So there's you know, probably, you know, file formatting systems and so on. There's a whole series of layers of abstraction. So you have, first of all, you have these 1001, and then someone is going to have a look at it and see partitions. So this has already been done. You see it shows up partitions. And in a partition, someone has to look, see, oh, wait, this is a FAT32 formatted USB key. So now I go FAT32 mode, and now I see directories and files. But this step has not been made yet. All there is is a partition showing up as a file. And you need to somehow get it into that media folder, but knowing that it is formatted in a special way, having a folder and not uh, a file. And this is called the mounting. You want to mount your USB key into slash media. Okay, um, so graphical user environment, you do it like that, you click it, and then it gets mounted, and then somehow it's there. And if you press this, button, it will be ejected, and then unmounted, and then it's off again. So um, while a system is mounted, um, files that you are copying onto it might not have been written to that device. So there might be in your memory, not, not on your USB key, in your memory, something hanging. And the reason for that is speed, because when you do a lot of writing, uh, then your USB key is too slow to respond, so what the system does, it just buffers it. Like, it puts it all into some queue, uh, gets it ready, and pretends like it's already on disk, but it's not. And only once you tell it to sync these things down to the disk, it will push it all through. And if you unplug your key before you sync, 
then this data will not be written to the disk, and it cannot be written because the disk has been physically removed. And then your disk will be corrupted, and you can actually easily lose data. And that is why under Mac OS X, for example, when you remove your disk, it's going to complain. It's going to tell, hey, you did not eject your disk. This is dangerous. Or under Windows, you always do this safe hardware removal. Under Linux, it's the same thing. You have to unmount before you unplug your disk. Of course, you can configure your system in a way not to buffer that, but it will be horribly, horribly much slower. So when you mount something, before you unplug it, always unmount. Of course, if you read only from a device, things are different. But if you write to it, especially if it's large files, you should unmount that. Now, there are two uh, operations, one being the mount. And the, the command is easy, but you have to be root for, do, for doing that. So sudo mount. What do I want to mount? Here, my USB key, first partition. Where do I want to mount it? Media, my USB. This command will not work on your system. It will tell you the mount point, which is that, does not exist. It's because you can only mount into folders. And the cool thing is you can mount into existing folders. So you don't have to mount things into media. This is just a convention again. So if you, have, if you want to have your downloads folder onto an, X, an SD card, let's say I don't have enough space on my SSD. And I have a lot of things in my downloads folder. So I want this SD card being always plugged into my computer. And I want to put anything that I ever download into my, onto my SD card and not onto my internal storage. I just mount my SD card into home Sandra downloads. And then anything that I put into downloads will not be written into my, onto my hard drive, but will be written into that SD card. Okay? That is why mounting is so powerful. Okay, anything, any, anybody, got, everybody got that? Did anybody, is anybody not clear with that? You're li definitely flying now. Okay, you look at me like that. What is he talking about, right? Who's, who's not clear with mounting? One, two. Okay, don't be ashamed. That's perfectly fine. Okay, okay. All right. So... This is a physical device. It's a representation of a physical device that we have. And I want to open the folders that are written on that device into my system. So I specify a target folder that will become the abstract representation of my USB key. And then my media, my, let's say I have a folder which is called kiddies on my USB drive. It will not show up under def sdb1 kitties because the sdb1 is a file. But when, as soon as I have completed this command, in slash media slash my USB, there will be a folder called kitties containing all my pictures of my cats. Okay? I don't have any cats, but it would have been nice. And this folder must exist. So what do you do before you can mount it? Anybody, any suggestions? How do we create that folder? Yeah, mkdir, right. So I go sudo mkdir slash media slash my USB. Sudo, of course, because media does not belong to me. It belongs to root. And then I can run this command, and then my USB key will be available there. Yes, question? I have files in my USB before I mount it. Yep. Can I access them while I mount the USB? If you have files in media my USB, those files will be magically gone when you mount, but magically back when you unmount. Okay. So it will hide whatever is in that folder and then put it back as soon as you unmount. Um, you probably shouldn't do that. Always mount it to empty folders. It's, it's a nicer practice. But I tried it once just for fun, so that's... Okay, um, for unmounting, you have to either sudo umount or, first of all, sync things. Um, this basically tells the system Anything that is in any cache of the system, no matter if it goes to a network... Oh, yes, you cannot only mount USB keys. I mean, you can mount network shares. You can mount uh, your NAS. I can, I can mount with one command, I can mount the NAS of my parents. And then I have their videos in my home folder. But it's really actually going through, uh, through, the, through the Internet. But with mounting, you don't have to care. It's just you will see with the speed. But before, before I... Un remove anything, I really have to be sure that the caches have been written back. So I do sync. Sync means write everything that you can back. And then this command is blocking. That means it will not, it will not show you that again until everything has been synced. And then suddenly it will look like that. And then you know everything is good. Okay, so um, 
Instead of syncing, you can also unmount. The difference is unmount will first sync and then remove the device from the mount point here, media, my USB. Sync will only write the caches back, but not change anything about this mounting state, OK? And so if I want to unmount it, I go U mount. It's not unmount, it's U mount. And this is a common mistake. I can either type dev sdb1 or type media my USB. Doesn't matter, the system knows both are the same. It's just a different level of extraction. And then remove that link after syncing, of course. Okay? And you have always to unmount everything because of that caches. Okay, everything clear? So in practice, it's easy. Mount, unmount. That's it. Uh, yep. Okay, um, oh, by the way, if you just type mount without any, uh, without any arguments, it will show you what is currently mounted. And you will probably find uh, one being mounted under slash, probably dev SDA something being mounted as slash. That is your system partition, which got mounted at boot automatically, which is then ruled by the FS tab, which we saw before. This is more advanced. Okay, um, now there's df. df is a nice command that shows you uh, sizes of everything that it has in bytes, so really long numbers, absolutely stupid. I would always recommend it using with dash h, human readable, where it will show you 1.2 gigs, so you can read it. So, for example, I see here, def sda1 is the actual device where my system is running on. It's mounted to slash. This is where my system is running on, okay? And it has totally 6.6 .6 gigabyte. It's a virtual machine. Uh, used 4.2, available 2.1, uses 68%. Okay, now maybe if I have here 74%, that is probably because I installed some programs, I removed them again, it was large programs. Now Zipper, the package manager, which is your friend, he will not always delete everything from your system, but it keeps the packages that it has downloaded in a way that if you decide to reinstall something you have just uninstalled, you don't have to download it anymore. It ha has a cache folder. Problem is that takes up space, and if you don't have much space in your computer, you might get up ending with a really high number here. And as soon as you get 100%, your system will break. Always check that you have enough free space to write on, okay? So if you want to tell Cl Zipper to clean its package cache, to get rid of that cache, to free the space it doesn't need, you go sudo zipper clean. And then it says all repositories have been cleaned up. And you see it has given me back here, in this case, 400 max. Especially in a system that has been running for a long time, when you install and remove a lot of software, your caches can get large. So if you're running out of space, sudo zipper clean is one thing how to unmess your system. And uh, that way, this is basically the only thing that remains, except for some configuration files. So your system doesn't really clutter. This is why it doesn't get slower, because everything gets removed that way. OK, now you can, you can script things. Um, now, this is, this is going advanced. And this is a huge topic. Just a very, very brief introduction. Um, what you have been learning so far is bash. Like this sudo bang bang only works in bash. It doesn't work in fish. Bash, again, is a program that gets your commands, uh, that interprets them, and that executes whatever is to be executed that you told it. And you, instead of typing that on your keyboard, you can type it into a text file, save it, and then run it automatically. So if you have sudo zipper in Chromium, Firefox, VLC, FileZilla, etc., etc., huge list of things that you want, you can write that in a file, and then just run this file as a script. And then bash, instead of reading from the keyboard, it will read from the file, and then execute that. And that way, you can automatize anything that you have learned so far, OK? This is where you're probably going to start to feel the power of the console. This you cannot do in any GUI. It's, it's like the ultimate super macro. You can do anything like that. OK, so um, scripts are run by interpreters, the one you know now being bash. Um, bash sometimes, bash is actually the nicer version of sh. sh has the same language as bash, but it doesn't talk to you as much. For example, they, I think tab competition and so on doesn't work on sh. But if you, whenever you have a bash script, it will also work under sh. So usually we don't use any scripts with bash something, which is going to use sh and then whatever your script is. 
just as a detail. And then for those, who, who programs Python? Quite a few. Python is just another uh, language which is interpreted. That means instead of typing your commands in Bash, you type in Python, and you run it as a regular program without even compiling anything, okay? Um, so either we do, we, when we want to run a script that we have written, so uh, let's see, there's this script here, meow.sh, looks like that, has three commands, echo hello world, cp something, like it copies itself to somewhere else, and ls. If you want to run that, we can go sh or bash and then script name. Now here, again, the extension is just for you. I could call this Python and it's be being bashed. That'd be perfectly fine for the system. It's just for, for yourself that you know what, what it's about. So you say the interpreter, which is a program, and you give as an argument to that command uh, the script that you want to run. Then the interpreter is going to consume it and do everything that it says. So if you want to write the virus, of course, a script virus, then you can do that. For example, typing... R M R F, and then uh, tilde, which means delete my entire home folder. If you write that into a script, you know. But yet now that you are able to understand the most basic commands, you can read yourself through a script. There's absolutely nothing hidden, uh, and you can check if something is safe or not instead of just copying, pasting it. Okay. Um, so, if you want to run a Python script. You go Python and script name. And you remember probably, if you just type on a Linux system, if you just type Python, uh, and a console comes up, an interpreter, and it, has, it says, hello, I am Python, now type your command. And you type your commands immediately, and they will be run uh, as soon as you type them. Just like in Bash. So Bash and Python are not that different, it's just they have very different syntax, okay? So when you think Bash, for you, you probably have seen commands in a Linux system. When you've seen Python, you have thought of it as a programming language. But actually, both are very similar. It's just that you have been using them in a different way. And by just going Python without any arguments, you get a console where you can type Python code. Just like when you go bash without any arguments, you open a new session where you can type bash commands. And if you give it with an argument, whatever it comes in will be run as a script. Okay, so either um, you tell the system how to run a script, or you tell the script how it should be run. And there's a magical line at the beginning, like the very first line in your script, you go crunch bang, or hash bang, and then you put the path to the interpreter. And then that way you can start a script with the dot slash notation, just like it if it was a program. But you have to make it executable first. Okay, so let's have a look at meow.sh. First of all, we have this magic header, crunch bang bin sh, and you remember that bin contains the really Linux system part, and in that bin folder is a program called sh, which is going to run anything that is coming up. Okay, so now you can type dot slash meow, and it will, well, it would run it as a regular program. It's a script. It has never been compiled. This is not machine code, okay? But you run it as, as if it was a program. And here you see if we just execute sh meow.sh, you see exactly what there is supposed to be. Echo gives this. CP is silent, so it doesn't output anything. And then ls shows uh, these two outputs. Now, the problem now, if we just create a new text file, and we go dot slash meow.sh, it will tell us permission denied, because the file is not executable. We have to mark it executable first. There is a command called chmod. It does a lot more things than just executable. But the, you, can, you can basically learn this by heart. If you want to be able to do something like that, you can go chmod a plus x. That means everybody can execute meow.sh. Um, if you want to read more about uh, chmod, it's very, very powerful. Um, for, this is out of scope of this course. Okay? And then you can go dot slash meow dot sh. What's going to happen is it's going to read, it's going to see, well, this is executable. So it's going to read the header, co bin sh, and it's going to do, it's going to call bin sh on that script. And it's going to be run, just like a regular program. Okay, now for example, there's a program, I think, called xflock, which is your lock screen under xfce. It sits under slash user slash bin. So you see slash user slash bin xflock4. And this is a program that will get run when you want to lock your screen. It's not a program. It's actually a script. So that means you can edit that in your text file, and you can modify its behavior. 
Now watch it, if you do a typo, if you do something wrong, your lock screen is broken, okay? But that way you can really modify anything without even having to, to recompile things. Okay, um, there's some, you know, you can do things conditionally. I, I will not get into this topic. Um, this means if this here is a regular file, then say Sandra started his thesis, else echo no thesis detected, and then, you know, infinitively say start your thesis, start your thesis, start your thesis. This is what, uh, what conditional statements look like in Bash. In Python, most of you probably know already. So it also exists in Bash. Or here, this is what a loop looks like. For i, I have a variable i, I want it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Counting sheep number, and it's going to do counting sheep number one, counting two number sheep number two, counting sheep number three, etc. Um, yeah, you can learn bash, bash syntax is really strange. Uh, yes, if you want to look it up, look it up. It is clearly out of the scope of this course, but just so you know, you can do it if you want to. And I, for example, have written uh, in Python, I think, uh, a program that automatically download, it, like evaluates websites and looks. Uh, looks at some different things and downloads some other things and renames files, etc. You can automize really anything. Just you have to learn the language first. But it's really tightly integrated. So Bash is very powerful, very beyond this course, of course. And um, you can type like these loop things that we saw here. You can type that in a console. What's going to happen is it's going to show a larger than symbol waiting for more input. Uh, you don't have to write that in a file. So in, in the console immediately, you can program your super mini script, and it's going to be exactly, it's going to be run uh, just like a regular command. It's the same thing if you go in a file or if you go in the, as, in the keyboard, okay? And um, when you hit enter, it corresponds to, to a line break like there, okay? And of course, you can schedule tasks like this cron chops, which we're talking about, run these scripts periodically. You can run them whenever your computer starts up, whenever you log in into your computer, before your computer shuts down, etc., etc., etc. So it's really universal. And yeah, this is this X of log four, which I already told you. And uh, Lucas, uh, who is the guy uh, who is waving his hand right now, <laughs> he has, for example, written a script that reads out his hardware sensor. So in his laptop screen, he's got a, a brightness sensor, and what he's doing is he's reading that out, multiplying it, like, like putting some mathematical formulas in it and then steering his screen brightness with that, which you can all do in a bash script. So he has his custom uh, luminosity sensor to screen brightness script. And this is, if you're really good, it's something you can do in five minutes. And else you just Google, 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 you know. But there's just a lot of things you can learn online, okay? So commands are universal. Any program, Firefox, Chromium, and so on, they are, every program is a command. And every script can be run as a command too. Shutdown, uh, reboot, screen brightness, etc. Really, anything that you have on your system can be steered from commands, and therefore can be automatized. And you can integrate your sensors. For example, mine has a tilting sensor. So what I can do is, if I shake my laptop, it locks the screen, or wh whatever I want to do. You know, it's all there. All you have to do is read it out, put it in, and of course, you can use scripts in other scripts or calls a script that calls itself, it's called recursion. Uh, you can com pipe commands together, like you can take the output that the program gives you, for example, when you have cat something, you can take that output, put it through another program, for example, grep, which is a search utility, and then put that into word count, which is uh, word count, yeah, utility, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what is the amount of lines that contain the word analysis in this file. So you go cat this file, pipe that to grep, uh, giving the argument uh, analysis, pipe that to word count. And it's going to output you a number telling you that this amount of lines. And it's really, really universal. And of course, um, you can bind anything to a keyboard command. So for example, I have here my keyboard command uh, for start, give me some music like play my favorite radio, um, lock my screen, mount my NAS, etc., uh, etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, can have, I have not, not only possibility to increase or decrease my screen brightness, but I have keys for absolute screen brightness. So for example, I just go, I don't know if, can, if you can see that way. 
I can go like this, like that, changing my screen brightness extraordinarily fast, having my three preferred screen brightnesses programmed in. And uh, there is no system that provides that to me. It just programmed it myself using one command. It's as simple as that. It's really trivial to do it once you get started. Okay. So the core script, we do have one from last semester. Um, I don't think we have reworked it uh, because we... We are students as well, and the ones who wanted to do it had exams, so they weren't able to do it. But you can use last semester's version. Um, it's just been written for OpenSUSE last semester or for Ubuntu one year ago, so choose your favorite. And of course, um, you go to the alternative under Know How, you'll find under the year where it was presented, uh, recordings of the, uh, of the videos, etc., and of course, uh, our course scripts. And it starts from zero, so again, it will explain you anything that you want. So what's coming up? Tomorrow, this was all dry theory. Tomorrow, we're going to put that into practice. And we're gonna, I hope I'm going to make you dream a little bit. I'm going to show you several applications of what you can do with that. And there are three sections, basic, uh, um, what was it called? Intermediate and advanced. Basic you can do already. Now, there's a lot of cool things you can do already. Intermediate, which is just Google a little bit, like half an hour, and you'll be able to do it. And then expert, which if you really work yourself into, into a topic, you'll be able to do. And there's Linux for expert uh, by our friend Alin. She's the one with the camera right now. And she is going to rock your way about seeing how to interact with Windows. So for, not, not Microsoft Windows, but Windows. So for example, on my system, uh, when I open up say two different windows, they don't superpose each other, they go on a side of each other, which makes my workflow extraordinarily fast. And that is called a tiling window manager. It's a simple topic, actually, but this has many different aspects, and Olin is going to give a very complete and extraordinarily interesting course about that. I got a preview, I have to say, it's really fascinating. So if you have any questions, if you want to talk about it, um, if you have trouble or whatever, come to our Stammtisch again. Again, the first beer is free. And we will be there. And you can also become a member of us, of course. That way, you're straight with us. You get to know the people uh, who do that. Okay, so that's it for today.